attention here recently are wood chips. Uh, after these big rains, and it usually takes a big rain, we're, we've seen it with these El Nino years, is that these wood chips get washed into the harbor. And to do my homework, what I did was go up to City College, and they've got some great gardens on the bluffs. It used to be a castle with cannons at one time with the Spanish. And they've got these beautiful gardens in there, and what they found is, is that the wood chips are very effective in, one, absorbing the water, uh, cutting down the amount of watering, cuts in on the, the amount of weeding they got to do, so it's very efficient. But the problem is, is that there's thousands and thousands of wood chips there. And on any kind of heavy rain, you look out in the harbor and you just see all these wood chips. And so most of us boaters are smart enough to realize that, well, you don't want to go out. But there are commercial operations, other people that aren't aware, and I've noticed even a few weeks after the fact that there are still issues with these wood chips ending in impugning, uh, heating up engines on the Sunset Kid. It got sucked in, got past the sea strainer, uh, was causing the heat up and costing money to troubleshoot it, what's the problem, and then get those wood chips and then flush that system out. A number of heads where they bring in raw water, even though they have a holding tank and it doesn't go in, they are using raw water. In a number of cases, those wood chips have impugned the gaskets for these manual pumps for the heads, and these things are expensive. The kit alone is 80 bucks, and it's, it's a monopoly. I mean, you've got to go to the manufacturer to get those gaskets to fit. So as a public awareness, I'd like to suggest if the waterfront, if there's something that could be done, even if it's low tech, that um, we've got time until next winter, that there could be some catch basin or something that could be maintained after the big rains. The other is uh, individually there could be an easy system to put in a little um, like sea strainer, um, a little um, way uh, filtering system that would allow these wood chips not to get into the, you know, the head system or the, um, the raw water cooling system. So uh, just the public awareness, uh, I'll try and bring this up again next year, but uh, it, it, it has the potential to cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And if people put two and two together, it could be a liability issue for the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, to approve the minutes, we'll, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Any changes? Anybody? I would motion to approve. Second. Uh, everybody unanimous? Or? Yes. 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 Okay, um, Mr. Bradley, for the uh, director's report. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Briefly, uh, this evening from um, my uh, report, just a couple of items that have gone on to council, uh, the ordinance involving the waterfront grill lease and their um, new improvement on their patio, a five-year lease with the visitor center down at uh, Garden Street in Cabrillo with the Chamber of Commerce, um, and lastly, our uh, Ocean Air Electronics, Doug Chesmore's um, new lease um, has uh, now gone on to council and been approved. The, the item which I highlighted uh, for you uh, is the uh, vacancy that we currently have on the Harbor Commission and the process for uh, applying for all uh, boards and advisory commissions um, by the City Council through the City Clerk's Office. That application process has been more or less completed in that on, um, I think it was May 10th, uh, applications needed to be filed. I listed for you the names of the individuals that have expressed an interest uh, in serving on the uh, Harbor Commission Board. Um, I do think that one of those individuals has already removed uh, their application in that they were unable to meet the dates for the mandatory interview. So it appears that Michael uh, Colon um, may not be participating in the process. But ha having said that, there are at least six or seven individuals that have expressed interest. I think that's great. Um, I bring this to your attention simply if you want to watch uh, the interviews which they will be conducting uh, in front of the City Council, I, I put the dates and times, um, Tuesday, May 25th, Tuesday, June 8th, uh, both of those will be around 4 p.m. Uh, at the City Council, and then the last 
interview uh, slot is June 15th, and that'll be an evening meeting, probably the uh, 6 p.m. start time they'll start the interviews. Um, if you'd also be so inclined or interested, you could go to the city clerk's office and review their application. I've taken the liberty to do that. Um, I believe Mr. Barnick and Mr. Miller are slip holders. Um, I uh, did confirm that. So um, we'll have to watch that process. And then the appointment should occur uh, the end of June. And by our July meeting, we should have a new member of the commission. And, and possibly, for the first time ever, uh, someone who may not be a city resident because with the charter change, uh, the opportunity to appoint someone to the board as a non-city resident um, uh, would be uh, coming up. So with that, I would conclude my report and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, and the, uh, the business services report, then. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Um, the lease with the Stearns Wharf wine tasting concession expired on March 31st and the tenant moved out of the premises on the 5th of April. Um, the facility staff has been busy in the site, um, removing the damaged subflooring, priming and patching and painting the walls, and just getting it ready for a uh, show. Uh, the department has determined we'll do a two-phase screening process in this case, starting with a request for qualifications for the, for the larger group and then uh, winnowing that down to a short list of folks and inviting them to a RFP or request for proposals process. The RFQ will emphasize uh, the tenant's financial qualifications, experience and qualifications in the wine industry specifically, and just a general business plan concept for the wine tasting room. And then the shortlist folks that we uh, invite to participate in the RFP, that'll be more of the focus for a very specific business plan, uh, floor plan, layout of the space, pro forma of expenses and revenues and so forth. So two-phase process to select the tenant. Um, the selection committee will, will see the uh, folks that submit the RFQ and will be involved in winnowing that down to the shortlist for the RFP folks. And then again, the selection committee will review the RFP submittals and select a primary tenant to negotiate a lease with. In terms of advertising, uh, we've had quite a bit of response. We well, hung a four lease sign on the space uh, early in the month of April and got a few calls. I've come to find that word of mouth travels quickly in the wine business, so I started getting a lot of calls from the sign and, and word of mouth including the morning after the Harbor Commission meeting where I announced this, I got a call from somebody who watched it on TV, 8.30 in the morning, my phone rang and I already had a call. So um, two weeks ago, I put an uh, ad on Craigslist and two other online, uh, winebusiness.com and wine industry classifieds, which were recommended to us by someone in the wine business. And those have also, Craigslist I probably got six hits off of, but this wine business, Dot com and wine industry classifieds have really generated some interest. So as of today, we have about 30 interested parties in the space, and we're getting ready to send out the RFP. We've got folks from San Ynez Valley locally and a couple from the 415 area code calling. So I think we'll have some real good qualified candidates to choose from. Um, moving on to the parking program, we've been looking into some possibly expanding our um, self-service or improving our self-service parking program. Currently, you may be familiar with the honor fee boxes that we use. We have 10 honor fee boxes in five of our lots. And it's a self-service cash-only system, pretty low tech. Um, downtown parking recently, and airport as well, recently upgraded their systems to include credit card acceptance. And that's kind of the way the world is moving, as away from cash and into the credit cards. So we'd like to follow that lead, and we worked with the vendor that supplied downtown parking with their credit card equipment, and they recommended a, a uh, product by a company, uh, Digital Payment Technologies. And they brought down a one of their machines and demonstrated it at the waterfront department for us, and we were quite impressed. It's very user-friendly, can be run on electrical power or solar power, comes with a stainless steel housing option upgrade, of course for our marine environment down there. Um, and it also interfaces or has the capability of standalone or interfacing over the internet 
with our uh, computers. And this will enable us to really um, uh, make our parking program more efficient in the sense that, for example, um, if you've got somebody's purchased three hours of parking in one of the honor fee lots, it'll tell us how much more time is left on that space. So if the Cabrillo East and West lots, everybody has lots of time left, but Garden Street, we have 20 or 15 cars that are about ready to expire, we can send our monitor right down there to focus on where the, um, where the expirations are happening. So that's a, that's a big efficiency we'd like to see happen. Um, digital payment technology is also offered to let us demo a machine for 30 or 60 days. It's going to be a little while we're, before we're able to do that, though, because the finance department has a backlog of credit card issues that they're sorting through. So they're not going to be able to take a look at this credit card machine and make sure it's compatible with city systems for another three or four months, most likely. So we may we may just opt to, de to demo the system on a cash-only basis and just see how we like it. Uh, that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anybody questions? I've got one. Um, Scott, will this continue to be a honor system in that there's not a gate they can just drive in? Madam Chair, Commissioner Spicer, that's correct. It'll simply there won't be a gate or a manned kiosk, a staffed kiosk. It'll simply be a self-service um, walk-up and pay station. And it also has the options of being a pay and display type mode where you'd put your money in and it spits out a ticket and you go put that on your windshield. That's the more low-tech solution. And then the more high-tech solution is pay by space where you punch into the system what space you're in, which is similar to the way our, our honor fee system functions now. And then it's specific to that space and that's what gives you the advantages of going on your computer and seeing which spaces are occupied and paid up and which aren't. Great. Thank you. Madam Chair, the only uh, comment that I would offer, um, if you've been to UCSB, uh, these are the exact same machines. Uh, so um, if you haven't, that would give you a test run as how well they, and, and many of us have already used those out there either with the credit card or cash or both. So That was going to be my, my question. And would you run it 24 hours a day uh, then? Would you anticipate doing that? Yeah. Madam Chair, that certainly would be an opportunity. Just leave them on all the time. Would you do that for all the lots? Madam Chair, Commissioner Sloan, we would we'd probably not do it for all the lots. I think we would start with the lots that already are the honor fee um, collection system lots. We could not do it with Stearns Wharf due to the complexities of the 90-minute validation on Stearns Wharf, and we couldn't do it with Harbor, Maine due to boat launch or um, trailer tickets and so forth, the 24-hour nature. So Yeah, that was my concern and the, the annual permits and everything else. And so, thanks. Do you have any thought of extending it to East Beach, uh, that lot? Yes, Madam Chair, we would, you know, provided that the demo works well, we'd probably start in Harbor West and then, you know, work work our way east. But definitely the east, Cabrillo East and Cabrillo West parking lots are excellent candidates for this type of system. Great. Thank you. I, I think, again, we probably should, Scott should mention the cost. Um, this is not something that we can, we, we budgeted for. It's not something we can implement um, all at once. What we'd probably do is, again, start, uh, with a lot and see how well it works. Uh, I think it'll work. I mean, I've used the ones at UCSB for years and they work quite well. Um, but it, it will be a period of time before we can fold this into the capital improvement uh, and replace out the honor fee system that we have. Scotty, can you comment on the cost? Maybe you did. I might have missed it. No, I did not. Um, we haven't got a, f a firm proposal from the company yet. They're going to give us a couple of alternatives for solar powered versus mm -hmm. um, hardwired, and of course, every little the stainless and the solar is a little more, a little more. Um, but they said that, and we were really worried because uh, UCSB was quite an expensive installation back when they first did it. But the technology has improved and gotten much more affordable. So they basically said, ballpark figure, the Cadillac of these machines would be somewhere around fourteen thousand five hundred apiece. Hmm. Thank you.
Okay, the next report would be from the facilities management. Mr. Treyberg. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. It's been quite a busy spring at the waterfront for the facilities division, uh, beginning with dredging. AIS Construction Company completed the spring cycle dredging for the Corps of Engineers in mid-April. They removed about 163,000 cubic meters of sand, which is uh, considerably more than the average of 120,000 cubic meters. We had quite a few storms earlier in the year, and uh, they got most of it out, which was uh, in very impressive job by them. It's the end of a three-year contract with the Corps of Engineers for AIS, so they demobilized everything, the dredge yard, the dredge pipe, and everything. The dredge will be stored in the harbor for a portion of the summer before it goes back up to Morro Bay. The project is going to go back out to bid this June by the Corps of Engineers for another three-year contract. Uh, we should get bids back in June, and dredging should resume in October, November, just like it has every year. But this is kind of a requirement in the way they do business. They also have uh, recently released a draft environmental assessment. They do this every six years pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act. And um, we provided some brief comments on it. They really haven't proposed any changes. We don't expect any issues or any delays based on that document or the review of that document. So we're going to go back and um, start all over again. Six years environmental issues will be, have been addressed, and then we'll have another three-year contract we expect in the spring. Um, a significant component of the dredging this year was the dredging along West Beach. There was two different projects, one that I had mentioned to the Commission that was funded by the County Parks and FEMA, and it had to deal with some trucked sand of about 30,000 cubic yards from this area in the intertidal area, and also uh, sand removed by an excavator dredge, on a, an excavator, big giant excavator on a barge, and hauled with a scow up to Goleta Beach for a beach nourishment project of another 10,000 cubic yards. That project totaled a little over 40,000, which was done by the county parks. But we followed up with what we call show here is the West Beach dredging after the federal channel had been completed. Uh, we appropriated funds that had been originally identified in the 2011 capital improvement program, had them appropriated for this fiscal year, and removed another 20,000 cubic yards. West Beach is probably in as good a shape it's been in in many, many years. It's uh, highly used by uh, small craft, and it's, it's still in the protected part of the harbor. So we're really pleased with the outcome of that entire project. Um, and, but it'll all be starting up again in uh, October. Um, out on Stearns Wharf and the City Pier, we, we combined two projects this year. Cushman Contracting Corporation did the regular heavy timber uh, re replacement on Stearns Wharf to maintain the structural integrity pile replacement, pile cap replacement, stringers and deck boards. Out on the city pier, we added stringers to improve the load-bearing capacity of that facility. We can uh, accommodate perhaps some bigger, heavier uses, such as maybe a squid loading op offloading operation. Uh, it didn't really hold, it wasn't really rated for fire trucks and stuff like that in the past, so this is a, a fairly significant upgrade. Um, even with change orders, including additional piles and, and stringers, the contract came in uh, well under what we had budgeted this year. It was only $115,000. So we have some additional funds, and we're going to move on to another component of Stearns Wharf maintenance, uh, maintenance. Excuse me. There are two locations on Stearns Wharf where we have steel piles. Um, one is under Moby Dick's Restaurant. They were installed in 1998-1999 after the fire out there, and the other is under the C Center. These piles, it's a little bit hard to see here, but uh, they're starting to show their age. Or they're starting to rust through. We've developed a uh, pile scaffolding um, feature that we can install, and we're going to go in and we're going to go ahead and paint up, treat, and paint the rusted areas under Moby Dicks this year. It's about 10 or 12 years. It's going to greatly extend the life of those, pile, those steel piles. Probably do the same thing under the C-Center uh, probably in another five years. And I will probably do this about every five years to just keep the steel piles safe. You can really extend the life of a steel pile by doing some relatively minor maintenance. Uh, moving over to the biggest project we've got going on, uh, the Marina One Replacement Project. We have a construction update for you this evening. Uh, on March 23rd, we held a little harbor community meeting. Uh, it was very well attended. Probably 20, 25 people showed up. The contractor and the subcontractor were both there, AIS and Bellingham Marine. Asked a lot of great questions, and we were able to go through the construction plan, walk through what we'd been doing, what we're going to do, and, and prepare them for next week, which is going to be an interesting couple of days. Um, the shoreside utility installation had been completed over the course of the winter, and that included a new electrical service kind of originating behind our building with a new transformer trenched uh, around our building uh, with five rather large electrical cables. 
that were taken out under the um, standing on the travel lift pier and routed through some submarine cables. So it was a pretty extensive operation to provide this new electrical feed. You kind of can't see it, but all along this fish float north here is all those five conduits that you can see there, and they all have submarine cables in it, and it provides all the new electrical feed from Marina One because it's all going to change over the course of this project. That was the shore side, uh, somewhat water side element of the project. The other main element of the project was the water side construction, and we had broken it down into four stages that I briefly discussed with the commission a couple months ago. Uh, temporary dock connection, stage one, dock assembly, stage two, which we're pretty much done with, and stage three, demolition, stage four, permanent utility connection. The temporary utilities was just a matter of running uh, temporary electrical lines from the transformers over to each finger so that they could go ahead and bring in the new docks. Took several weeks, wasn't too bad. Uh, Harbor community was very tolerant of all of this, and there were very few power outages, so the contractor did a pretty good job limiting disruption to the uh, Marina One slip holders. The dock assembly, for the most part, took place at the launch ramp. The, the individual concrete floats, all 75 of them, were sub-assembled there. And then they were towed over to Marina One and put together adjacent to the Marina One, the east side restroom out by the Marina One expansion. Uh, this is right by Q-Finger. They were all put together and lined up along the main headwalk. And anybody who's been out there has seen this condition. It's been that way for, gosh, close to a month now. It's, it's, it's pretty labor intensive to go and attach all the utilities and everything else. And it's uh, been quite an undertaking. Uh, there's a lot of safety issues associated with this. And we've worked closely with the contractor to make sure that we have ramps where there's differential elevations between the new docks and the old docks, going over electrical cables, and, of course, signage to let everybody know that this is a construction zone and it's uh, not the safest place. It, it's surprisingly, like I said, the slip holders have been wonderful. They've been very tolerant, very patient, and uh, so far things have gone pretty good. Um, we repositioned the transformers this week, which was pretty much the final stage in preparation for next week's repositioning of the main headwalk into the... Uh, into its permanent uh, location. The blue line demonstrates or, or shows where the, the, oh, this doesn't show up, there it is. The blue line shows where the, this is the new headwalk on both sides, and it's on this side over here by the bathroom because, of course, they couldn't build it alongside where the restroom is. So the first thing they're going to do on Monday morning, that's this Monday at 7 in the morning, they're going to go ahead and demolition the old dock and slide those two into place. The next element of it is to install these transition floats so people can get from the new docks to the old docks and install a gangway. It's probably going to take all of Monday and Tuesday. It's, it's a pretty long and drawn out process. The marina for the most part is closed those two days. We will be providing water taxi service by the Little Toot who currently provides the water taxi service over to Stearns Warp. They'll be picking up people on the accommodation dock and taking them over probably running every 15 or 20 minutes from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., and after that, people are on their own. So we've contacted all the liveaboards and the BA, the business activity permit holders to let them know this is going on. So if they can get their way to and from the, their boats on their own, they can. But the main headwalk is going to be closed, and we're, we're pretty much discouraging anybody from coming down those two days because it's going to be quite busy. There's no water. The restrooms are closed. Um, but it'll be an interesting couple of days. <laughs> The final stage is phase four, uh, stage four, permanent utility connection. So once it's in place, they install the electrical and the cable right down the middle of the dock in those conduits that you saw in some of the previous pictures. And then the domestic and fire water, it's already attached, but it just has to be hooked up. And uh, it's a pretty involved operation. We expect everything to be completed by mid-June, and that's assuming everything goes well next Monday and Tuesday. Um, it's been a pretty good project, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that we uh, don't uncover anything that's going to delay it any longer than it already has been. And uh, like I said, we appreciate everybody's cooperation. The, the slip holders in Marina 1 have really been great. And that concludes my report this evening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. It's an amazing project. And any questions, any comments? Uh, yeah, um, I had a question about the, the dredging. I know in, the, uh, in our past meetings there was the issue of, of cost and unanticipated possible over costs. Is, will we not know until August till the bids come in, or is there any kind of indication on uh, what the new bids are going to be? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Friedman, uh, what you're referring to is the, the, the uh, 
President's budget and Cong the Congress's appropriation of a little over $2 million this year in the, in the budget. The Corps' estimate was about was over $3 million. So there's obviously a bit of a discrepancy, but you, no one really knows until it actually goes out to bid to just see what that discrepancy, whether or not there's going to be a big difference in how they would fund the, uh, the higher cost, if there is indeed one. We work closely with the LA District of the Corps of Engineers and, and hope that if there is something if it does come in higher than they expect, that they'll be able to shift funds uh, within the LA district itself to pay for that. So we'll know better in, in, in like you said, in August. Madam Chair, Commissioner Friedman, um, I was going to report on this at the Commission staff communications uh, portion of the agenda, but given that you've asked the question, I might as well address it now. Um, I think we have some good news in that uh, this week, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I got an email from our um, lobbyist in Washington, D.C., who had indicated that um, uh, Senator uh, Dianne Feinstein had made a request um, to bump up the $2 million president's budget al uh, allowance or appropriation to the 3.75. Uh, number that we had gotten from the Corps of Engineers. Uh, so that's a positive step in the right direction. That doesn't necessarily mean we have the funding. At least we've gotten one of our congressional representatives to make that request, which was part of my um, efforts in traveling back to Washington. I'm fairly confident we'll get the same support from uh, Lois Capp's office also. Uh, so the process is underway. We won't know that either until probably after the November election. Uh, so it'll it'll be long into the fall. Um, a lot of people have asked what's going to happen with the old docks. Perhaps you could address that. Madam Chair, the, the owner of the company intends on using those old docks on his farm for a, some sort of a wall so they'll get reused and won't wind up in the landfill. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for this? Thank you very much. The Harbor Operations Report. Good evening, Good Madam Chair and Commissioners. Well, I was going to start by telling you what a busy month we had in operations, but I can't hold a candle to Mr. Triberg. So let's say we, we had an active month in operations, starting with uh, May 8th. On Saturday the 8th, we started with Operation Clean Sweep. Uh, we had a terrific turnout of volunteers. Uh, as you recall, this is the seafloor debris cleanup that we've been doing now for four years. Uh, we focused this year on areas uh, beneath the Cabrillo Landing and the, the Sea Urchin Fisherman's Dock in front of the Waterfront Center building and uh, under the uh, uh, Fish Float South and the City Pier all the way out to the Fuel Dock. And we collected a ton and a half of stuff, um, and it, was, uh, it brings our total to 15,000 pounds for the four years we've been working on this. Next year we'll be moving over to Marina One and starting a five-year effort in Marina One uh, step by step, and that will complete our first 10 years uh, doing this. Um, I want to uh, extend a special thank you to our volunteers from NOAA, the Maritime Museum, Salty Dog uh, uh, Dive Service, uh, the Surfrider Foundation, they show up every year, and plenty of our local boaters just showed up to lend a hand, and it was, uh, and it was really terrific. I think Carl has a couple slides here, just three, to show you. These are uh, the folks kicking in. They move their boats around. They use their equipment on their dive boats to help lift, uh, the, you know, everything from anchors to chain and old fish gear and fishing traps and hoses and, and what have you. And, and this young lady from NOAA, this is the only, the last slide I have. This, I think she uh, is a candidate for uh, a, a bit part on the world's dirtiest job. She was uh, up to her elbows in mud like that all day long, and, and we just can't thank those volunteers enough for chipping in and doing the right thing here. And, and also, once again, tip of the hat to the fishermen. They really took uh, the stewardship of their own docks very seriously and did a, a, a major cleanup under the own, their own area where they, where they dock. So thanks to them, and we look forward to seeing all of them again next year. On the following day, we had a cruise ship visit from the Prince, uh, Sapphire Princess, a 950-foot, 110,000-ton cruise ship. Uh, as, it, as it typically is, it anchored about a half mile offshore, and they tendered uh, some 2,250 people, uh, passengers on shore, and about 206 crew. That's an update from what you see in your staff report. That's the, the final numbers. And uh, they were greeted by a whole core of hospitality uh, folks, 
really the best display of hospitality I think we've had for a cruise ship visit. The downtown organization, the Conference and Visitors Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, the folks from Montecito were there, and it was very, very well organized. We, they had pre-booked tours. They had live tours that you could take once you got there to the wine country, around town, uh, up State Street, and, of course, there were uh, self-guided tours, upstate walking tours that people enjoyed as well. So it all went very smoothly. The ship came at 7, departed at 4. Uh, the only real challenge was there was a, uh, so we say, say a freshening, uh, call it a stiff northwest breeze in the afternoon that became a little bit of a challenge for the, uh, the tender boats with their experienced operators, and they got through it. So uh, all was well and ended well on that front. It was a good visit. And then the next weekend we had our uh, uh, Harbor Nautical Swap Meet, and hazardous materials turn-in day, and I'm happy to report that that was a terrific success too. In fact, it was the most successful in the four years we've been doing it. We had uh, 46 vendors uh, participate uh, who uh, occupied a total of 62 spaces in the Marina 3 parking lot, and uh, walking the rounds, I, I, I got an enthusiastic thumbs up from the vendors. They really did a lot of business. Now, sometimes it's vendors reselling stuff they bought two years ago to, to you know, other vendors, and there's an internal dynamic at work as well. But uh, I think the community really likes it, and we'll, this is certainly on the radar now, and I think we look forward to it now uh, every year. It was uh, a, a partnership we do with the Harbor Merchants Association. Uh, they uh, they uh, got the profits, and in turn they supplied and, and worked with Santa Barbara Roasting Company and uh, the Berry Man and others to provide uh, free uh, donuts, coffee, bagels, and cream cheese, oranges, and what have you to the public, the community, and the vendors, and anybody that wanted it. And it lasted a long time, except I think next year we might get more of it. So uh, it lasts even longer. Um, I'm happy to report that the NOAA uh, information kiosk up in the foyer or the lobby of the Harbor Master's office is back online after being down for six months. This is that electronic kiosk that offers you information about the Channel Islands and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and also uh, uh, offers a, a current and forecasted weather conditions, buoy reports, forecasts, radar images, and what have you. Uh, it was down for six months. So it was, I guess, a hardware and a software problem. Um, this is one of 30 of these kind of stations NOAA has around the country. But I guess one of the problems with ours and maybe some of the others is that some of the parts were manufactured in France. So there was a, a bit of a time lag getting it up and running. But it is running. It's open 24-7, 365. The only caveat to that is after 5 o'clock, from 5 in the evening until 8 in the morning, the only time you can use it is when Harbor Patrol officers are actually in the office since administrative staff has gone during those hours. Folks are welcome to come up and use it if Harbor Patrol officers are there. But if they're not there, the, door, the front door to the office, the south door, will be uh, locked anyway. And if they are there and the officers have to go on a call, they'll be politely you know, escorted out and, and uh, offered to come back when the officers are there. But we're happy to have that up and, and hope uh, the public takes advantage of it. On the environmental front, we had a kind of a curious fish die-off uh, in the harbor this month. Uh, beginning on uh, Monday, April 26, it appeared that a lot of the small, what we call bait fish, uh, anchovies, sardines, and small Pacific mackerel, mackerel or blue mackerel as they're known, uh, began dying in the harbor. And it's typical of these events, uh, you know, looking uh, not too distant from the cause. It's very hard to determine the baseline cause, uh, us not being experts in that, and even the experts not being absolutely sure. But the immediate cause is usually a, a low dissolved oxygen in the water. Uh, we tested, uh, we have a protocol for testing uh, seven stations in the harbor for dissolved oxygen. Uh, I believe they're the same stations we test for bacterial indicators. And in, sure enough, the, the, the DO levels were very, very low. And we post those results. One of the primary reasons we post those results, of course, on the marina gates is so that uh, commercial fishermen who keep their catch in receivers, be it fin fish or, or uh, invertebrates like rock crab and lobsters and what have you, are able to, uh, uh, it gives them the opportunity to move them, relocate them outside the harbor for a period of time if they wish, where the dissolved oxygen levels are typically higher as they were in this event. The event baited, abated within 24 to 36 hours, and then it returned, and it sort of waxed and waned that way for a period of a, like a week plus, and uh, knock on wood, it hasn't returned since around uh, the middle of the month, and uh, we believe it's uh, probably concluded its cycle for this time. 
Just so you know, Ventura and Los Angeles Harbor uh, incur um, incurred similar die-offs and low dissolved oxygen levels right about the same time as ours. And we did see that we can confirm a cause and effect relationship, kind of a filmy, gauzy, green algae, you know, stew of stuff uh, in the harbor at that time. But we're uh, very much convinced, and speaking with NOAA's biologists, uh, they are convinced as well that it wasn't an in-harbor related cause, that it's nothing that, you know, you know, has been done in the harbor, no spill, no upset of any kind that causes it's a natural phenomenon, and it happens now and then, and we just try to get the, war the uh, notices out as quickly as possible and let nature do her thing. This didn't rise to the level of us calling in contractors as, and to do any cleanup, as the fish were very small and very scattered. Uh, uh, about seven years ago, we actually had to call in some cleanup crews to help us when some of the small flatfish, the turbots and starry flounders and what have you, would look like little pie plates. They'd gone belly up, and we called in a cleanup crew to help us. This didn't rise to that level. And finally, Madam Chair, <clears throat> and I hope this doesn't sound like the Harbor Patrol Rescue of the Month. It's not intended to, but there was one rescue I wanted to note for you that took place uh, in late April on the 21st, that really shines more of a light on the community participation than on Harbor Patrol, who did what we have come to expect from them, and they did an excellent job in, in saving an individual who was uh, in very, very windy northwest weather, whose inflatable skiff had uh, overturned, and then he had managed to right it, but it was a wash, and he was uh, quasi-hypothermic, and he was sailing out to sea. He was on his way with no help and no way of communicating. And an individual who was down near the beach checking the surf at Hammonds called dispatch. It was relayed to us. And the key thing that they did was they never took the eye, their eye off the victim. They had the ID correct. They talked about the size of the skiff. They identified the clothing the man was wearing. And they kept an eye on the individual the whole time. And once again, this just underscores the partnership we have with the community in boating rescues and medical responses and law enforcement responses that the, the more the reporting parties, uh, the better job they can do uh, keeping an eye on things and doing a good job describing and identifying uh, subjects, victims, perpetrators, uh, what have you in these kinds of circumstances, the better we can do this, our job. And so I think it's, it's, it's equally plausible to say that um, uh, this individual, you know, took as big a responsibility and role in this event uh, as we did. And so we take their hat, we ha our hat off to the public as well. And finally, Madam Chair, I apologize. Uh, I forgot to mention that the Harbor uh, Nautical Swap Meet was combined, as it has been the last several years, with a hazardous materials turn-in day, uh, which we encouraged folks to, you know, clean out their dock boxes before the season and the, you know, furthest reaches of their of their vessels. And uh, and we would, that would turned out to be very successful. We had um, uh, 38 contributors uh, to the hazardous materials truck, everything from paint to oil, antifreeze, fluorescent tubes, solvents, diesel propane bottle, bottles, varnish, flares, and small batteries contributed to the, the mix. And so uh, we believe that's an equal, uh, equally successful component of this event. We'll continue to utilize it. And I think the boaters were happy about it, too. And that does conclude my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your report. Are there any questions? Uh, Commissioner Friedman. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank staff uh, for the Operation Clean Sweep. I think this is a great program that we've put together in the community, especially the nonprofits that are involved, such as Channel Keeper and Surf Rider. Uh, it's a tremendous uh, program. Um, I had a couple questions, one about the cruise ship visit. I noticed that there's a, um, it gets more into uh, a, a revenue or funding issue. I noticed there was a $5 uh, charge. Is that per, uh, per head that came in? Does that come directly to uh, the Waterfront Department or is it City General Fund? And then I have a couple other questions as well. Um, in terms of, it, I noticed that we're looking at possible future visits from uh, additional uh, cruise ships. Uh, do we have an estimate of how many and what can we handle as a, as a community? Because uh, I know at a certain point, um, depending on how many come in, there'd be a lot of questions from the community on, on the number that would come in. And then um, I think it's, it's a plus in terms of revenue, uh, potential revenue. But also, I know that cruise ships, there are some other negative impacts, such as uh, visual impacts and um, potentially environmental impacts, because they're not the most environmentally uh, friendly uh, vessels. But uh, so if we do look at um, having more uh, come in to our, to our area, are we taking into consideration, aside from revenue, other potential impacts that the community might um, address? And then um, 
After that, I have another question about the, um, the, the patrol rescue. Madam Chair, um, Commissioner Friedman, all very good questions. Um, we'll deal with the easy one first. The $5 uh, per head is for the manifest. Uh, doesn't require them to leave the vessel. So however many passengers they're carrying along with their crew, the department receives a $5 per, per head um, payment. So I think it was around $18,000 that we would have uh, received as uh, part of the latest um, cruise ship visit. Um, it's expected that that individual or um, couple spends somewhere around $100 per person while at shore. Um, we get the $5. What they spend in town goes to uh, sales tax um, that comes into the city's general fund. So the, f the $5 is the department's fee for the coordination efforts that we put in place. And I think it's safe to say Brian Slagle does a, a great job of coordinating all that and um, works well with the uh, host agencies. Relative to the number of visits, it's always been a, a, a debate about how many um, of these that um, we can handle, how many of these we should plan for, or wh when is uh, too many too much. Um, we have to coordinate these events far in advance of the visit, uh, sometimes six months or more. Uh, both in terms of coordinating the um, facility landing, which is sea landing. Um, sea landing gets paid a fee to basically get out of business for their um, dive boats and fish boats for the day for the most part and commit to servicing the tenders that come in and off the boat. Um, they aren't prepared to do that on an ongoing basis. So I, I, I think we're limited as to how many we would get, both in terms of the number of ships that want to come and visit, how often sea landing can make themselves available, and then again that balance of what we think is, is reasonable. Um, I think we've always talked about no more than three or four per year um, would seemingly be a, a good number uh, for us to uh, strive to get. Um, we've never reached that uh, number ever. I think at the most we've had maybe two uh, per year. Well, when we, that's right. When we had the swine flu, we had two back to back. Um, but um, I think that's the number that we're talking about. If um, we're able to uh, attract or interest other cruise lines besides Princess or Cr Princess on a more frequent basis to come because they've been the uh, most frequent visitor. Relative to the uh, environmental aspect of it, I'm going to let Mick answer uh, that portion because he's worked very closely with uh, the cruise line people and the captains and also, I believe, Channel Keeper uh, directly about what we expect and what we'll tolerate. And if you don't, then you won't ever come back again. That's an intro. Um, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Friedman, uh, the D Director Bradley is correct. We have worked with the uh, cruise lines on the environmental issues, and they've been very, very cooperative. Legally, they can dump three miles offshore, but uh, owing to the uh, sensitivities around uh, at-sea dumping and the perception, if not the reality, that three miles doesn't cut it for the city of Santa Barbara as part of this, let's call it, team approach, uh, the, the cruise lines have agreed to sign, and the, the individual uh, uh, cruise lines need to sign this. We've been mo working mostly with Princess. An agreement that says they won't uh, dump anything uh, until they're at least 12 miles offshore of the coast of Santa Barbara, and they need to be underway and making way when they do so. They can't just sit there and dump, you know, some odd thousands of gallons of, you know, black water in one spot. So. Uh, those are the two restrictions we placed on them. Those are above and beyond the environmental uh, regulatory restrictions that exist. And also, as John mentioned, we have worked with Surfrider and, excuse me, with Channel Keeper and actually encouraged them. They uh, uh, oftentimes will do water sampling and water testing around the ship itself to ensure uh, compliance with those uh, with those agreements. I'm not sure they did it this last trip. 
Um, they may, quite, in, quite frankly, be confident by now. I wouldn't want to speak for them, but it's, it's entirely plausible. They're confident now that there aren't any of those kind of nearshore discharges. But we certainly encourage them to participate, you know, to continue doing that if they so choose. Uh, thank you for that. Um, sounds like we got the environmental impacts covered, which is great. Um, and lastly, my, my last uh, more of a question related to the uh, harbor rescue. Uh, I think it's great that we were, we were able to uh, uh, work to facilitate that and, and get um, the individual the assistance they needed. Uh, but I did notice in the staff report that um, this individual has previous contacts with our staff. Um, it doesn't refer to what they are, and, and that's I can, kind of beside the point. But one question I have is if there's someone out there who's making frequent contacts, whether or not they're, especially if they're needing to be rescued on a number of occasions, um, and it kind of points to somewhat negligence, that's what I would think, if you're constantly being, uh, have to be rescued. Is there a way to do cost recovery on those uh, in a way? Because I know there would be costs associated with, with sending, um, sending it out in our staff time and, and the emergency services. So I wonder who picks up the tab for that? Do we do that? or? Or is there a way to get any kind of cost recovery from this individual if they're a repeat offender? Madam Chair and Commissioner Friedman, thank you. It's a great question. We've actually even considered in the past charging for courtesy tows. That's sort of the level that we started at. But quite frankly, to use the, the idiom we use, this is what we do. Um, it, it's very difficult to pick and choose who we're going to save, and whether they're chronic repeaters whether you know, uh, and what have you. Boating is boating, and it's a sliding scale as to who's a prudent and responsible boater and who isn't. Sure, do we sometimes gnash our teeth and go, oh, it's Joe Blow again, here we go? Well, maybe a little, but primarily, I can assure you, the folks in our department, when it's time to save a life and rescue people, they don't make those distinctions. And, and, and I think quite in, in, in all honesty, once you start making those distinctions and start looking for cost recovery in emergency rescues, it's a, it's a difficult and slippery slope and really one that, that uh, wouldn't get us to where we would conceptually want to be. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Are there any, any, any other questions? Commissioner Spicer? Yeah, I had one uh, small question. Um, Operation Clean Sweep, which I, I echo my colleague Eric uh, and a great job. Um, we've done that for a number of years now, and um, my twofold uh, is it becoming more maintenance? Is it becoming more of a maintenance of keeping it clean as opposed to starting from scratch? And I think I know the answer. And then my second question is kind of anecdotal. It, did we come up with anything that surprised us? Did you find anything that was shocking? Anything that you'd care to share? <laughs> <laughs> Anything juicy. Um, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner Spicer, we won't know the answer to your first question, whether it's maintenance or um, new stuff, until we do a full circumnavigation, if you will, of the harbor. And that's still going to take us another five years to come back to, to a starting point. It would be my intention, if the volunteer spirit is still there, to begin again. And to, and to begin to, to answer that very question that you have asked. Hopefully the answer is maintenance. And by a couple sweeps, you know, we're able to go from annual to biannual to triannual, something like that, and really have the comfort that we've done this litter removal in a, in a, a conscientious and, and uh, stepwise manner, and we've achieved that point. And your second question, oh, uh, stuff. Well, the only unique thing about no diamond rings, no, you know, no Jimmy Hoffa, nothing like that, but... Um, the only unique thing about this year, and it's somewhat predictable, is there was more commercial kind of junk uh, under the, oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, we did find two marine batteries, which brings the total over four years to five batteries. Um, but this stuff with, under the fishing docks, under the fuel dock, under the city pier, uh, was more of a commercial grade kind of stuff. There was less, fewer bowsprits and barbecues and bicycles and deck chairs and more pipes and chain and receivers and, and things like that. that that's um, the, the only uh, answer I can give you on that one. Sure. Thank you very much. And we're moving on to Mr. To Mr. Bridley's um, Outdoors Santa Barbara Visitor Center Agreement. Uh, Recommendation that Harbor Commission consider and recommend to Council approval of a five-year co-sponsorship agreement with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the National Park Service, and the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum for the continued operation of the Outdoor Santa Barbara Visitor Center located on the fourth floor of the Waterfront Center building. 
Madam Chair, Commissioners, the uh, collaboration bet between the cities and the city and the three original co-sponsors, uh, as Mary mentioned, NOAA, National Park Service, and Forest Service, began in 1999. The department's contribution was to donate, if you will, rent-free the fourth floor. Uh, former radio room in the Naval Reserve Center building, also referred to as the Crow's Nest sometimes. Um, the the co-sponsors uh, provided everything else. They built out the exhibits. They had some nice tile work done on the floor and walls representing Shumash legends and, and so forth. I uh, installed a computer station up there so folks can get on the computer and, and look up things about the islands and the local areas, distribute brochures and, and so forth. Uh, they put in some viewing telescopes and, and some other things. Um, initially, the Park Service provided docents and staffed the, uh, the center with their, their docents, and the Waterfront Department provided a subsidy on the magnitude of 13700 a year for the oversight and scheduling of those docents by a National Park Service part-time staff. That subsidy was phased out in the previous agreement gradually between 2002 and 2007, so the department no longer subsidizes the uh, operation in any way. The current agreement expired in January of 2007. We've been working on a new one ever since. Um, at the, right as we were about to get a new one in place, the Forest Service decided to drop out, and the Maritime Museum fortunately stepped in and began providing and scheduling docents for the visitor center. And it was a nice arrangement because there's some symmetry there with the, the Maritime Museum docents staffing their kiosk in the um, lobby in the bottom and then staffing the, the top as well in the uh, visitor center. The basic terms of the uh, agreement are, are a five-year term from the date of council approval. Rent is not a applicable in this case. They don't pay any rent. There's, as I mentioned, no f sub further subsidy. And uh, the hours of operation are 10 to 5, six days a week. And there is a termination clause, so there's very little risk to any of the parties upon 60 days written notice and, the, you know, the agreement can be ended. Uh, the Maritime Museum, I don't have any figures prior to when the Maritime Museum took over the, the docenting, but they attract 18,000 visitors to the center since they began uh, staffing it in July of 2008 up through March of 2010. Um, and all the other business terms remain similar to the or identical to the previous co-sponsorship agreement. That concludes the report. I'd be happy to answer, answer any question about the Visitor Center. Does anyone have any questions? And uh, uh, Commissioner Sloan. Um, have we looked at any other uses for that? I know there probably aren't any, but I thought I'd just ask anyway. Um, Commissioner Sloan, um, back during the development of the Harbor Master Plan, I think I referenced it in the report, there was thought given to allowing some sort of public use in that space, and and the National Park Service stepped in early on um, as, a, as a party that was interested in providing that. I don't know what else uh, you could use the space for, really. I mean, I suppose maybe uh, Chuck's Waterfront Grill, Endless Summer might could possibly be do something do something with it. I you know if it became available, they do have a first right refusal on any vacancy that occurs in that building, but it, it really doesn't lend itself to that. Due to fire code, um, the access to the space is is difficult, and I think the fire code has a maximum occupancy up there of nine people or something. So, like I say, it really doesn't lend itself to much else. Thanks. And I think you're looking for a recommendation from us. So anybody would like to do that? Second. It's been moved and seconded to recommend to the City Council. And uh, want to vote? Should we vote? All in favor? All in favor? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, please. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, next section. The mun Municipal Code Title 17 Amendments. Recommendation that Harbor Commission A receive and consider a staff report describing proposed amendments to Title 17 of the Santa Barbara Municipal Code 
B. Receive and consider a staff report describing proposed amendments to resolution number 09075 pertaining to timing of compliance with rules and regulations for moorings in the East Beach mooring area. C. Recommend to City Council adoption of an ordinance incorporating proposed amendments to Title 17 and recommend to City Council adoption of a resolution incorporating revisions to resolution number 09075. Madam Chair and Commissioners, uh, as you know, uh, annually, well, maybe you don't know, those of you who are new to the Commission, we work with the City's Attorney's Office to identify elements in Title 17 of the Municipal Code, that's the title, uh, end title, the, uh, the, excuse me, the title uh, called Harbor, uh, to see what needs to be updated, amended, deleted, so that it provides the proper legal framework and is contemporary with our operations and policies and programs at the waterfront. It's, it's worked very well over the last several years to, to sort of keep us consistent in the code with what we're doing in the field, and this year is no different. And we bring to you tonight uh, for your uh, recommended uh, advancing to City Council six substantive items uh, in the Municipal Code. They're really fairly simple. I'll try to describe them that way anyway. And, uh, and one uh, 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 resolution. Now, the resolution won't go to the Ordinance Committee. The resolution would go straight to City Council. But the six Municipal Code items would go to the Ordinance Committee first. And before I begin, I just want to let you know that um, the, the draft ordinance that you see uh, as attachment one is, in fact, that a draft. Uh, the city attorney's office and I are working uh, as we speak on formatting and tweaking uh, some of the, the various aspects of the ordinance. But so what we're really uh, asking your uh, a vote on tonight is the substance you're going to hear in the staff report. If there are any substantive changes to the ordinance itself, other than formatting and, and, and wordsmithing, what have you, we would certainly bring that back to you for your review and approval. Uh, so I just want to let you know, you can even see by looking at it, some of the font is different, where things have been inserted, et cetera. It's a work in progress. So what I'm going to do uh, with your, with your uh, uh, consent, Madam, Mayor, Madam Chair, um, is to uh, go through these. I'm going to reference these as one, two, three, four, five, and and uh, try to stay away from the municipal code uh, section references. What I'll do is I'll say this is number one, and you'll find it on a, you know the attachment pages one and two. And if necessary, I'll go back and re reference the uh, municipal code uh, section it's in. But that would it would tend to muddle things if I'm you know reciting a bunch of numbers. The first one deals with our uh, liveaboard uh, permits and and uh, uh, determination thereof, if it's ever necessary. And years ago, the municipal code uh, under the liveaboard section uh, had was written in a fashion that had language in it that had really kind of a complex and a little bit vague uh, uh, language that was tiered. It had a suspension provision, and then it had a stepped-up revocation provision, and then it was actually absent a termination provision, even though that was in the title of the section. And so what we've done in order to uh, seek consistency, and that's a theme you'll hear from me uh, over the next, hopefully, 10 or 15 minutes I can do this, is consistency. In order to be consistent with other permits we issue in the harbor, slip permits being a classic example, we decided to do away with the revocation and suspension, suspension and revocation language in here. And I, I don't believe Mr. Bradley can correct me. I know in my 10 years here, and uh, Mr. Bradley's 14 plus, I don't believe we've ever actually gone through that iterative process of a suspension and a revocation. So what we've done is we've recrafted it as termination language and spelled out what the causes of, of termination would be, non-payment, you know, uh, uh, bad behavior, et cetera, et cetera. And we've also included into the liveaboard permit, and you'll hear more about this tonight, the exact same appeal language that exists for slip permittees. It's actually language we apply to various other permits as part of this year's update to the, to the, to the, uh, the code. So those are the main changes uh, in number one. Um, and it, uh, it, uh, it also allows liveaboard permittees as one added extra. After six months, if they've had a permit uh, terminated for one reason or another, and we terminate very few of these, we've been very lucky with the behavior of liveaboard permittees. 
uh, they would have an opportunity to reapply. As long as the code is silent on reapplication for a liveaboard permit for somebody who's had one terminated, it leaves it hanging out there as a question, can I, can't I? And what we've got here is a six-month clause it's basically, you know, after six months they can come back, and if it was terminated for reasons that can be mitigated or have been mitigated, it would be up to the discretion of the waterfront director as to whether or not to reissue a liveaboard permit uh, to that individual. Number two is uh, termination of slip permits. And what we've really done there, and it's very simple, it mirrors what we, I just told you about liveaboard permits. We've added language. The same question was hanging out there. If we had a... If I, if I had my slip permit terminated, when can I reapply? Can I come in tomorrow and reapply for a slip permit? And absent that language, it left the question hanging. So what we've done is we've added language suggesting that after a year, they could come back and reapply for a slip permit. Um, you know, we've terminated slips uh, for slip permits for something as innocuous as people falling on tough times and just not being able to make their payments. And they're very unfortunate situations, and they've had to have been terminated. I know your your board has heard those termination appeals. But we've also terminated slip permits for, you know, really poor behavior, including drug dealing and, and other nefarious things. And so after that year of hiatus, it would be up to the discretion of the waterfront director to say, you know what, this was A, not B, or this was B, not A, and we will or will not uh, give you another slip permit. So what we're doing is trying to, to fill that vacuum with intelligent and, and consistent uh, public policy. Number three uh, involves appeal of mooring permit termination, and that has really been, that's a consistency matter. We've added to that the exact same appeal language that's in slip permits and proposed to be in liveaboard permits. And that language, of course, uh, offers a two-step approach. They can come to the waterfront director if they've had a, a mooring permit terminated and or liveaboard or slip permit, and they can seek a waiver from the waterfront director, and barring success getting a waiver, they would come to the Harbor Commission whose decision on the matter would be final. So. Um, uh, that that would that's going to apply to moorings, and you're going to see business activity permits, slip uh, permits, liveaboard permits, all those permits. We're looking for consistency in that appeal process, if in fact there is a termination. Numbers four, five, and six all deal with our business activity permit program. Our BAPs, as we call them, are uh, issued to individuals who do not have leaseholds in the harbor. Uh, they do business, uh, you know, they do the, the folks who do the bright work, the, the folks who work on engines, the folks who we issue them to six-pack charter operators and what have you. And the, the BAP language uh, heretofore had referenced uh, that it was necessary to have the BAP if you were doing commercial activity in the harbor area. There are certain exclusions to this, of course. People, contractors don't need it. Commercial fishermen don't need it. But if you're doing the other kinds of work I described, it was necessary to have a business activity permit to do that in the harbor. Well, what we found, and is sometimes the case as we, as we continue to tune up uh, or uh, amend the municipal code, is that... People were operating outside the, the aegis of that. They were selling ice cream cones in the parking lot, and we had one individual who read the code and said, well, I have a fuel scrubbing operation. I don't want to do it in the harbor, and I can see I can't do it in the harbor, so I'm going to go do it in the anchorage, which, you know, for pollution reasons and fire and, you know, and, and safety reasons was, was not a good idea. So what we've done here is we've asked that you – that uh, the um, – uh, sought to, to amend the ordinance to include the Harbor District, change that from Harbor to Harbor District, which of course be all of the, the waters of the city and, uh, and the navigable, I mean, excuse me, and the tidelands either submerged or, uh, or accreted. So that would be, uh, that change. Also, uh, at the, um, uh, the, there is also an amendment offered, uh, in response to um, in, this is number five, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair, that I'm looking at now. Um, this would, uh, th there is language in the business activity permit section governing uh, who can and procedures for uh, advertising, posting circular, you know, posting notices, uh, distributing circulars and what have you in the harbor. And, uh, and, and what this amendment does, as noted in number five, it tightens the language and makes it consistent with existing codes such as our the city's sign ordinance, but also and equally important, the original the language that's in there now says that it, the 
public information boards that we're all familiar with at the Marina Gates, those cork boards that get cleared off at the first of the month, and are really up there for anybody to put almost anything. It's it, the code. The code currently says that those posts can be made at the discretion of the waterfront director. And working with the city attorney's office, it's become clear to us that the last thing we want to do is is uh, uh, accidentally or uh, inappropriately trample on or step on anybody's uh, First Amendment constitutional rights to freedom of speech. So we're removing that discretionary language. And instead, we've actually already put little placards up on the boards that says no offensive you know, uh, posts are permitted. And if we thought something was offensive, if we got a complaint that something was offensive, I can assure you we check with the city attorney's office before we remove anything. Because that those boards are sort of a sacrosanct little area in the harbor where people can post whatever they want for sale or you know meetings and things like that. And it's certainly not in our in our uh, uh, we shouldn't be you know the ones who are the arbiters of what should be up there and what's not. So we're proposing to remove that discretionary language. A uh, number six is also uh, a BAP, and this uh, again mirrors the appeal process I told you about earlier. This adds an appeal process for uh, business activity permits. If they're either denied, in other words, no, you cannot have, you may not have a business activity permit because of A, B, or C reason, or if you do have a business activity permit, it's been terminated for whatever reason. This same appeal process that I have described to you earlier in this presentation that applies to slip permits, mooring permits, and liveaboard permits would apply to business activity permits as well. Exact same process, opportunity for a waiver from the waterfront director. If waiver denied, final appeal to the Harbor Commission, your appeal is, is final in that regard on all of these appeal items. And finally, Madam Chair, is the resolution. This is the resolution that sets out the rules and regulations for issuing mooring permits in our East Beach mooring. And what we've done is we've liberalized this a little bit. There's language in there currently that says if a vessel's uh, been sold, replaced, destroyed, or what have you, the individual has 90 days to replace it. And we found that some individuals have had a difficulty had difficulty meeting that timeline. So we checked what the timeline was for slip permits for somebody to replace a vessel um, that is sold, let's say, uh, a slip permittee, and it's 120 days. So we've raised this from 90 to 120 days, A, for consistency reasons, and B, because I think it's fairer to the individuals you know, who want to go out and get the right vessel uh, for their mooring if they, have, if they sell one or have one lost or destroyed. And also, we also changed some language. When we, wrote, when we first wrote the ordinance for the, the mooring area, we were, we were um, totally unaware of how this was going to turn out. And so we were very rigorous on the fact that if, if it migrates off station or if it's terminated, you have three days to get it out of there. You know, or to replace it on station. Well, finding a mooring contractor who's, you know, who is, uh, you know, uh, um, an approved mooring inspector who's available and can do the job and pulling together the cash and finding the timeline in three days is a, is a little bit uh, prompt. And so, four years into the program, we think that at least extending it to ten days uh, is fair. And again, that's con consistent with the amount of time they are allowed to even make a uh, an appeal of a termination. And so um, if, uh, if, if 10 days uh, works for you, it certainly works for us. It liberalizes it makes it more consistent with those other aspects of the ordinance. Uh, and in conclusion, Madam Chair, I'd say that this, what we're offering